Our subject this morning is God's unconditional election. Our scripture reading is taken from Jeremiah chapter 18 and Romans chapter 9, verses 21 through 23. The scriptures are printed in your bulletin, so let's stand for the reading of the scripture. The word of the Lord which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. <clears throat> then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels, and the vessel that he made of clay was marked in the hand of the potter, so he made it in the hand then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. Hath not the potter power over the clay? of the same law, to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endure with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory. Thank you. Be seated, please. This vast world was full of lost people. And God looked down upon this lost and dying world and He chose to save some. Notice, to save some. He did not choose to save all. We're going to see that as we go through these scriptures. I'd like to begin with my outline so you'll see where I'm going with this. I want to speak this morning on the characteristics of election, the time of election, the message of election, the subjects of election, the words of election, the proof of election, the creeds of election, and the certainty of election. I'd like to read Ephesians chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now what is it that He blessed us with? He tells us in verse 4. According as He hath chosen us in Him. He hath chosen us. Now most people get that backward and they say we have chosen Him. Right. No, that's not right. We didn't choose Him. Jesus said, Ye have not chosen Me, but I have chosen you. Amen. We need to get the cart before the horse uh, in the right way. Then He goes on to say, In Him, that is, in Christ. All salvation is in Christ, in Christ alone. Then He goes on to say, Before the foundation of the world, before God created the universe, before any of us were ever brought into being, He chose us. How could He chose us when He didn't even have a sight of us? We were not even brought into the world. The world had not been created. There were none of us. 
there at the time. But before the foundation of the world, back in eternity past, God looked down on a lost and dying world. He saw people under the judgment of God for their sin. And He chose this one and this one and this one and this one. And He chose the people that He was going to save when they were born and brought into this world. He has chosen His people. And He didn't choose all people. We know that because there are people that have died and gone to hell. They're spoken of in the Bible. So He didn't plan to save every person. But He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Back in eternity past, God singled out, God picked out those He wanted for Himself to be His children, to be His family, and to belong to Him. Then He goes on to say the purpose for saving them that they should be holy and without blame before Him. In love, having predestinated us, that means predetermined us, under the adoption of children. The adoption of children. You know, God doesn't have any natural children. God never had a wife. He doesn't have any natural children. So how do people become the children of God? Well, you have it right here in this verse. Verse 5. Predestinated us, predetermined us, under the adoption of children. We are the adopted children of God. We're God's children. He adopted us out of the people of this world to be His very own people. And that's called election. <clears throat> according to the good pleasure of His will. Now notice that. It was His will to choose us. It was not our will. It was His will to choose us. That's chapter 1 of Ephesians and verse 5. Now this doctrine of divine election is not a minor doctrine. It is a major doctrine. It is one of the cornerstones of the five cornerstones that make up the foundation of salvation. So the very first one is found in verse, in the Old Testament rather, 93 times. 93 times you find electing grace. In the New Testament, you find New Testament 30 times. When you add all of them up, the Bible teaches 150 times that God elected a people for Himself. Now, 150 times is a lot of times. And because there are many who do not believe this doctrine, I've printed out for you some of the references from the Bible. And all you have to do is just fold that up and put it in your Bible, take it home with you, and sit down and read it. And you will see over and over and over again, God chose, God elected. That's what it means. To choose means to elect, or to elect means to choose. God chose a people for His name. And he tells us when he did it. He said before the foundation of the world. So you and I could not have had any part in that. We weren't there before the foundation of the world. Only he was there. The divine trinity was the only occupants of the universe. We were not there. We couldn't have had any part in our election. Now this election is to salvation. And it determines who will go to heaven and who will not. 
First of all, understand this morning that God the Father elected us in eternity past to be His very own people. Secondly, God the Son saved us in the present time through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and the shed blood of the cross. And then thirdly, God the Holy Spirit applied the life of Christ to our dead souls and made us alive. So the entire Trinity was at work in our salvation. Amen. The Father elected us, the Son died for us, the Holy Spirit applied eternal life to our souls. Amen. There you have the work of the entire Trinity in those three persons. Now let me give you some of the characteristics of divine election. It's unconditional because you had no part in it. God did the choosing. He did the electing. You didn't do it. He did it. Now you didn't do it later, but at the time, you weren't around. You couldn't have had any part in the electing grace of God. So what does it mean? First of all, one of the characteristics of this doctrine is it's unconditional. God does not require any part of your effort to elect you. He chose to elect you because He loved you and because He wanted you. And He sent His Son to die for you. So you didn't have any part in your divine election. It's a gratuitous election depending on nothing outside of God Himself. Secondly, this doctrine is unchangeable. No one can change God's divine election. He settled it a long time ago. You know, sometimes there's a song that goes, the old account was settled long ago. Long ago, the old account was settled long ago. Long ago, He predestinated us to the adoption of children. So it's an unchangeable doctrine. No one can change it. The devil can't do anything about it. The devil hates it, but he can't do anything about it. We're his forever. In the third place, it's eternal. God hath chosen you from the beginning. And then it, if God's choice has been from eternity, then it will last till eternity. This is the unassailable comfort of God's people. Nothing can survive to eternity but what came from eternity. And then in the fourth place, this doctrine of election is personal. It's not corporate. It's not a, a group. <coughs> Excuse me. It's a personal individual election. He chose this man and this lady, and this boy, and this girl. It's personal. Election is personal. There are some who have tried to make it in Israel a corporate election and, and phase out any personal election. But if you read those verses that I gave you this morning, you'll see that could not be. He did elect Israel, but he also elected individuals besides Israel. If God chose the Jews, then He chose this Jew, and that Jew, and that Jew, individually. I'm glad because if it was a corporate election, I might have not been in, in it. I might have been left out. But He personally chose me, and He chose you if you're a Christian. In the fifth place, it is to sanctification. We are saved to sanctification. If a person says, I am one of God's elect, but he lives in drunkenness, he lives in licentiousness, he lives in wickedness, he cannot claim to be one of God's elect. Because if that's the way he lives, 
he probably was not one of God's elect unless God later chose to save him because of his sin. But one who has been elected will be saved and he will do what is right. Now, consider the time of election. Election took place, the Bible says, before the foundation of the world. Nobody can change that. That's in the Bible. Ephesians 1 4, I'm going to read it to you. According as he had chosen us, that's election, in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love, having predestinated us under the adoption of children. So we have the time element here. The time of election took place before the creation of the universe. Before the first man was ever made in the Garden of Eden. Nobody was on the earth at that time when he elected his people. Revelation 3, 5. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. I will not blot out his name out of the book of life but will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Now the election was from the beginning. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 We are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Now notice, God chose you to salvation. Election is unto salvation. Election is not salvation. It is unto election. Salvation takes place after the election. First there's the election, then there's the salvation which follows it. But if you get the cart before the horse, right. it won't work. He elected us unto salvation. And then there is the message of election. What is the message of the doctrine of election? It is simply that election is unto salvation by the preaching of the gospel. Amen. That's how in time we see God work in time. The other was before time. Now this is in time. In time, Jesus came, died on the cross, rose again from the dead. And that is the message of the gospel. That's the part that saves. But without God choosing and electing, there would be no salvation. You see, the salvation is based upon the election. God elects, Jesus saves. It's so simple. And yet that's what the Bible states over and over and over again. But people have taken that and turned it completely around and said, we're saved because we chose Him. How did you chose your election when you weren't even here? When you weren't born? When the universe did not exist? How could you have had anything to do with your electing grace? God elected you before time and Jesus saved you in time but keep them separate there are two different things all together and they follow an order preachers like to speak about the ordo salutis the ordo salutis is the Latin for the order of salvation there is an order in which God follows in saving people that's the Ordo Salutis. It's His order. And His order was election took place first before the foundation of the world and salvation took place after Jesus came to the earth long after the creation of the universe. So we want to keep those two separate because one depends on the other. Right. Our salvation depends on our being elected. Now, if God did not elect a person, he will never be saved. Right. 
And if he is saved, it's because God did elect him. God reaches down, chooses his people, and then in time sends Jesus to die for them so they can be saved. Now if you reverse that order, you don't have a pure picture of the Ordo Salutis. You need to keep that straight. The election is before the foundation of the world. Revelation 13, 8 says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship Him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So notice that, Revelation 13, 8. There were those whose names were not written in the Lamb's book of life. They will never be saved. Right. He will never take the names of His people out of His book. Now election, according to 2 Thessalonians 2.13, says we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. Just think of that. God chose you to salvation. He knew the names of all those that He chose. He had their names written down in the Lamb's book of life. And He sends the Son to come and redeem those whose names he wrote in the Lamb's book of life. And that's what the Son came to do. He said, I came to do thy will, O God. He finished the work his Father gave him to do. And that was to die for the elect, for those that the Father chose. Then there is the message of election. What is the message in reference to election? It is the gospel. That's exactly what I'm doing this morning. I'm preaching the gospel to you through the message of election, putting election in its proper place, and then the gospel in its proper place. The election is unto salvation. Now, election doesn't save anybody. But election guarantees who God is going to save and guarantees that they will be saved. He said, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and I, him that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out. God is saying, I will not turn away any sinner that comes to me for salvation. Because if he comes to the Lord for salvation, it is because the Father had chosen that one in electing grace. 1 Corinthians 1.21 After the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Through preaching, God saves His elect. He saves His children through the preaching of the gospel. In verse 19, Go ye therefore, Jesus said, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Jesus, when He saves a sinner, never leaves him. He stays with him through thick and thin, through trial and trouble, through sorrow and heartache. He never leaves the child of God. One of God's divine elect is saved by God's grace. And he, the, the Lord will never leave that child of God. Revelation 22, 17 says, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Who is the Bride? The Church is the Bride of Christ. 
Christ has a bride. That bride is all the Father's elect that He came and died on the cross for. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Here we are told that any sinner who's thirsting for salvation, who's thirsting for forgiveness of sin, who's thirsting to be right with God, if he's thirsting for God, if he will come to Christ, Christ will save him. Amen. That's God's message. Amen. That's what we preach. Election does not forbid anyone from coming right. to Jesus. Right. It never says, no, you cannot come. But it does tell us that only the elect will come. Right. Now that's the truth of God's Word. Do you know that this truth that I'm preaching to you this morning is so hated by the world and by the devil? It is so hated that men gnash their teeth when you preach this truth to them. You know why they get angry? You know why they don't like this truth? It's because they realize they have to give up their own sovereignty right. to Him. They have to say to Him, Lord, You are Lord. Right. I am Your servant. You give up Your sovereignty to receive His grace. But those who demand their own sovereignty, those who say, I'm the master of my faith, I'm the captain of my soul, I can save myself, I can do enough good works to work my way into heaven. They will never see the inside of heaven because only sinners saved by grace will ever see the inside of heaven. Only God's electing people will get there to heaven. The others will not. Now men don't like that. Men don't like to hear that. It, it, it makes them angry. I, I've seen them walk out of the church and slam the door so hard it almost fell off the hinges. Why? Because I told them the truth about themselves and about God's grace. They didn't like it. They didn't want it. And you try to you just try to approach some unsaved person today and tell him about the Lord Jesus and watch what happens. You, you will get an abrupt departure from him. He won't stay around and talk to you. He don't want to hear about Jesus. He don't care about the Bible. He doesn't want the church. And he's testifying by his actions that he's not one of God's elect. He's not one of those that God chose unless God in grace decides that He was one of His and then He converts Him by the power of the Holy Spirit and then He becomes a child of God. I can remember how rebellious I was before the Lord saved me. I wanted to go my own way. I wanted to do my own thing. And I did pretty much what I wanted to do. But I was so miserable. And then one night I heard the gospel. And I realized that I needed Jesus. I realized that I wasn't anything. Just a poor lost sinner in need of cleansing and salvation. And I went to him and said to him, Lord, here I am. Here I am. Amen. A sinner. Save me, Lord. And He did. He didn't save me because I went to Him and asked Him. He saved me because the Father had chosen me before eternity and Jesus had come to die for me and the Spirit of God wooed me and drew me to the Lord Jesus Christ and saved me. Amen. Oh, what a wonderful day that was for me. I remember the next morning when I got awake and I looked around in the bedroom and I looked out the window and the grass was greener and the sky was bluer and everything was different. A whole new world had opened up to me. God's grace 
had reached me. Not because of anything I did, but back before the foundation of the world, He wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And then, centuries and centuries later, as time rolled by, He sent His Son down to do a job for Him. That was to save a poor sinner like me. Election. The message of election is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the subjects of election. Who are the elect? Why doesn't God just elect everyone? Well, He doesn't choose to. If He chose to, He would. But He doesn't choose to. He chooses those that He chooses. And only those. And anyone who wants to be saved can be saved. If he will come to Christ, then he will discover that he is indeed one of God's elected people. Now the subjects of election, who are they? They are any sinner that turns to Christ. Any sinner that turns to Christ will do so because God chose him. And in time, send his son to die for them. You see, that is so simple. I read in Ephesians 5, or 1, 5. Having predestinated us. What does the word predestination mean? It means to predetermine destiny. God predetermined my destiny. When he wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life, when he elected me, to saving grace before the world was. He predetermined my destiny. And my destiny was to be saved by the work of His Son, the Lord Jesus, and to be His child, and even to be a preacher. Mm -hmm. Having predestinated us under the adoption of children, you know we hear a lot about being born again into the family of God. But let me listen. Let me tell you what this verse says. Having predestinated us under the adoption of children. The adoption of children. Here's a man and a woman and they don't have any children. And they go down to the hospital and they see a bunch of little babies and they say to the nurse, We'd like to adopt that one right there. That one right there. We want to adopt him. We don't have any children. We want to adopt him. So they fill out the papers. When the papers are approved, they go to the hospital, they pick up that little boy, and they take him home, and they make him their child. And he becomes their child, grows up in their home, but he was not their birth child. He was their adopted child. He's adopted. And the Bible says in Ephesians 1.5, having predestinated us under the adoption of children. I'm an adopted child of God. I belong to the Father. I'm in the family. And that's why we sing that family song here. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. And when that little boy from the hospital is taken into that family, he's as much a part of that family.